disseminate and digest how the British expression of Egypt uh, led to the colonization of Africa. And we ended with Cecil Rhodes' wild dream of painting Africa red by connecting the Cape, by connecting the Cape to Cairo. And we are saying all of that came about because um, the British wanted to consolidate their claim and control over Egypt. And we are saying that wild dream is what made them to take over Mashona land, the Cape of Good Hope, Nyasa land, Matebele land, or what came to be northern and southern Rhodesia. That is to say, present day Zambia and Zimbabwe. Now, as Cecil Rhodes was coming up with that wild dream, the French, okay, the French also wanted to try and avert, okay, and frustrate that wild dream of Cecil Rhodes. So they also came up with an idea, an idea of connecting, an idea of connecting their French West Africa. When I say French West Africa, I'm talking about Senegal to Somaliland. Senegal to Somaliland. Okay? All of that happened simply because um, the French wanted to frustrate the wild dream of the British uh, general, okay, of uh, connecting the Cape to Cairo, okay? So, with this, if fulfilled, this would enable the French to still have access to the Nile, okay? So, at the end of the day, what happened? It gave them access to Burundi. Rwanda was annexed. Part of Eritrea. Eritrea, okay? And Somaliland. Or Somalia, okay? These were annexed. We are trying to show how the problem was started by the British occupation of Egypt in 18, 1882. But at the end of the day, we are going to see the whole of Africa being annexed and the cause being the British occupation of Egypt. Now, meanwhile, in order for the French to still have access to the Nile, they moved away from West Africa and went into Central Africa. Okay, in Central Africa, the French sent an Italian adventurer and explorer by the names of Savogenan de Braza. Savogenan Savogenan de Braza, okay, to sign treaties with the local chiefs in the Congo region. And indeed, de Braza managed to sign treaties with Chief Makoko of the Teke people. Chief Makoko of the Teke people. Now, as the French were advancing into Congo or Central Africa, okay, Leopold also developed interest in the same area. And Leopold, Leopold the second, sent H.M. Stanley to also sign treaties with the local chiefs in the same area. So you can see the controversy being created by the French as a result of being pushed out of Egypt. So the French were just moving and roaming around all over Africa like a muddy dogs or a muddy dog, okay? And their movement was aiming at enabling them to have access, okay? Access to the Nile. They had not lost hope of having access to the Nile. So that is why they had to go into Congo in Central Africa. But of course, in Congo, they met uh, Leopold who had sent H.M. Stanley, and that culminated into what came to be known as the Congo Crisis. The Congo Crisis, okay? The Congo Crisis also, at the backstage, had other players like the Portuguese, okay? We had Britain, which came in to support Portugal. We also had USA, okay, which came in to support Leopold simply because he had employed an American as his secretary known as uh, Strandford, okay. And of course, that culminated into the Congo crisis, okay. Now, the British occupation of Egypt 
had not yet been sorted. And indeed, the British had not yet been recognized as the legal claimants over, over Egypt. Mm. So, the French going into Central Africa or Congo, because of being pushed out of Egypt, okay, necessitated roundtable negotiations. Okay? Roundtable negotiations to sort out the controversy. It was during that time that eventually the Berlin Conference of 1884 to 85 was called. Okay? The Berlin Conference of 1884 to 85 was called. Okay? The Berlin Conference was called by Otto von Bismarck. Okay? And that conference was supposed to sort out controversies that had developed among the European powers as far as colonization of Africa was concerned. Okay? Now, listen very carefully. It was during the Berlin Conference that the Egyptian question was sorted out and indeed the British were recognized as the legal climates over, over Egypt. Okay? It was also during the Berlin Conference that the Congo question was sorted out. Okay? That the Congo question was sorted out and we are going to see how that was sorted out, okay? But also, the Berlin Conference was used as a stepping stone, a stepping stone, as a stepping stone by Germany to show its change in attitude as far as colonization of Africa was concerned. And indeed, remember earlier on, Germany had a negative attitude as far as colonization was concerned, okay? And indeed, you remember that at one time, um, the Germans even made an assertion, Bismarck made an assertion, that colonies were not worthy bonds of a single German soldier. However, after the calling, because of the unification of Germany, coupled with the pressure that was inserted onto the German government by the industrialists and the traders, okay, exerting, pressurizing the German government, to go elsewhere and look for areas where suitable and potential resources would be attained as raw materials, the German government eventually changed its attitude and the change of attitude was shown during the calling of the Berlin Conference where now Germany actively participated in the territorial acquisition. So it was the British occupation of Egypt that precipitated the calling of the Berlin Conference. The calling of the Berlin Conference in order to sort out the Egyptian question changed or showed a change in attitude of Germany and indeed Germany eventually took over areas such as Togo, Cameroon, southwestern Rhodesia, which eventually became Namibia, and also recognized the activities of Carl Peters in Tanganyika. Carl Peters. Carl Peters in Tanganyika. You can see now, okay? Germany coming in on the pretext of being an honest broker, trying to sort out controversies among the European powers, but eventually using it as a scapegoat to also participate in the acquisition. And one of the conflicts that Germany had to sort out was the Egyptian question, okay? Was the Egyptian question. Mm -hmm. What eventually happened also, with the calling of the Berlin Conference, um, Congo was partitioned between France and, and Leopold, okay? Congo was partitioned between France and Leopold. What happened? Uh, lower Congo, okay, or Southern Congo, to include the watershed, to include the watershed between rivers, Zambezi, and the Congo Basin, rivers, Zambezi, and the Congo Basin, to include Katanga region, were given to Leopold, and this all together became Congo Free State. 
This was Lower Congo. Congo Free State, including the watershed between rivers Zambezi and the Congo Basin, to include the Katanga region being given to Leopold and eventually became Congo Free State. Then, Upper Congo, Upper Congo, all this happened after the calling of the Berlin Conference. Which Berlin Conference partly was precipitated by the British expression of Egypt. Okay? Upper Congo was given to France and this became Congo Brazzaville. Congo 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 Brazzaville. Okay? Now, there was one power that was yet to be sorted out. Remember I said in the Congo crisis or the clash over Congo, there were backstage players. I talked about the Portuguese. I talked about the British as well as USA. Now, how are the Portuguese sorted out? We can say that it was the British occupation of Egypt in 1882 that partly led to the Portuguese occupation of Angola and Mozambique. So the Portuguese occupied Angola. Angola. The Portuguese occupied Angola. The Portuguese occupied Angola and Mozambique. Okay? So, it meant that the Congo question had been sorted out just like the Egyptian question. Now, meanwhile, as Leopold had been recognized as the legal climate over Lower Congo, or the area that came to be known as the Congo Free State, he became ambitious. Leopold II became ambitious. He wanted to expand his Congo empire eastwards to Zanzibar without defining without defining the northern boundaries, okay? Leopold became ambitious and wanted to expand his Congo empire eastwards to Zanzibar without defining the northern boundaries. It was that, ladies and gentlemen, that made the French and the British to panic. Don't forget the French had not lost the hope of controlling the Nile, of having access to the Nile. So what happened? The French advanced. French advanced from Upper Congo under their general known as Machan, General Machan, General Machan led the French forces all the way from Upper Congo. And of course, the British could not sit back. Remember to them, Egypt was the Nile, and the Nile was Egypt. They were not ready to let any European power occupy any of the territories along the Nile Valley, for that would have disorganized their activities in Egypt. So the French also, the British also advanced. The British advanced from Egypt and their explorer, Lord Kitchener. Lord Kitchener. When I'm talking about advancement, I'm referring to forces, okay? Under uh, Lord Kitchener. And it is it too we are almost clashing at a mere sandy bank known as Fashoda. At a mere sandy bank known as Fashoda. And it was that that culminated into the Fashoda crisis. That culminated into the Fashoda crisis of 1896 to 98. The Fashoda crisis, therefore, was the moment when the French forces almost clashed with the British forces at a mere sand bank known as Fashoda. And I'm using the word almost. What does it insinuate? That these two did not actually fight. Roundtable negotiations were made. And how did it end? The Fashoda crisis ended with the British occupation of Sudan in 1898. Okay? You are aware that the British reconquered Sudan after the collapse and decline of the Mahdist state. The Mahdist state had been viewed during, after the Mahdist revolt. The Mahdist revolt had been led by Muhammad Ahmed the Mahdi. Mahdi simply meant God sent. The Mahdist state or regime 
had been created after the decline and dismissal of the Taco Egyptian rule in Sudan. That was a combination of the Turks and Egyptians administering Sudan. Someone may wonder, why a combination of the Turks and the Egyptians? Because Egypt then was not fully autonomous. Egypt then was not fully independent. And because it was a part of the Ottoman Empire, okay, whatever it did, it had to do it in consultation with the Ottoman Sultan. And that is why even after annexing Sudan during the days of Muhammad Ali, between 1820s to 1830s, okay, Egypt could not independently administer Sudan. Okay, so the government that was created thereafter was known as the Taco Egyptian rule. That government uh, lasted for a period of 65 years. So if the annexation of Sudan by Egypt took place in 1820s, you just add 65 years. It simply means that it collapsed in 1885. Okay, so it was the collapse of the Taco Egyptian rule or government or administration that created foundation or that laid foundation for the Mahdist state. The Mahdist state had been created by the success of the Mahdist revolt. The Mahdist revolt had been led by Muhammad Ahmed the Mahdi. And I'm saying Mahdi simply meant God sent. Okay? Simply meant God sent. But of course, um, later on, around 1896 98, the Mahdist state uh, was weakened. It became weak uh, because of quite a number of rebellious tribes that had constituted uh, the state and of course coupled with other external factors such as the era of scramble and partition the Mahdi state crumbled or collapsed and indeed it was also during that very time that the Fashoda crisis took place and indeed the Fashoda crisis ended with the British occupation of Sudan. Sudan was a unique country. It was one country that lost its independence twice. Initially to the Egyptians and then again to the British in 18, in 1898, okay? Now, you can see that the whole of the entire Nile Valley was now annexed, and now the British were safe. But again, it did not end at that. What happened? Later on, the French, for purposes of uh, contentment, went ahead and occupied the Maghreb region. Maghreb region. And when we talk about the Maghreb region, our focus will be on Morocco. On Morocco. Okay. The French occupied Morocco in 1912. But the occupation of Morocco came about as a result of the signing of the Anglo French intent. Anglo French. Intent of 1904. Okay? For those who have already covered the history of the Maghreb region, Maghreb is just an Arabic word to mean Arab world, and it constitutes of basically four countries. Of course, if we are to go by the order through which they lost their independence, I'm referring to the Maghreb states, we'll begin with Algeria, which was annexed in 1830, followed by Tunisia, which was annexed in 1881, still by the same European power, that is to say France. But of course we cannot talk about those two European powers because the time frame of the question does not fit. You cannot say that the British occupation of Egypt in 1882 led to the French occupation of Algeria and Tunisia. That would be distortion of historical facts because you're talking about Algeria, a country that was annexed in 1830. So it meant that Algeria was annexed earlier on before even the British occupied Egypt. We cannot make a mention of Tunisia because it was annexed a year before the British occupied Egypt in 1882. So in order to make sense, our focus will be on Morocco, which was annexed in 1912 after the signing of the Anglo-French Entente of 1904. Okay? If you started with us, the discussion, you can see how the whole of Africa was being taken over, how the whole of Africa was being annexed as a result 
of the British occupation of Egypt in 1882. Now, with this agreement, the British were to let the French or were to recognize the French interests in Morocco on the pretext of the French withdrawing their interests over Egypt. Over Egypt. Okay? Over Egypt. And indeed, in order for the French to safeguard their economic and strategic interests over the Maghreb region, hope you are aware that the French took over three Maghreb countries. Algeria, Tunisia, and Morocco. And of course, that was being done for strategic and economic reasons. Okay? So, the French decided to withdraw their interests over Egypt, and indeed, the moment they did that, the British also went ahead and recognized their interests over Morocco. We can also say that indirectly, indirectly, it was the British occupation of Egypt that can also be used to explain the Italian occupation of Libya, Italian occupation of Libya in 1911. Italian occupation of Libya in 1911. Okay? Italian occupation of Libya in 1911. Why? The Italians had made massive investments in Tunisia. Okay? And indeed they were the first aliens or foreigners to occupy Tunisia. Unfortunately, for strategic reasons, and as part of appeasement policy, okay, of uh, Otto von Bismarck, using the Berlin Congress of 1878, Bismarck recognized the French interests over Tunisia. What did it insinuate? It simply meant that the Italians who had occupied Tunisia were supposed to vacate. And as a result of public sympathy, okay, um, with other series of diplomatic meetings that had been made, for example, 1888 and 1902, respectively, other European powers recognized the Italian occupation of Libya. Because the Italians had been inconvenienced in quotes. How were they inconvenienced? They had been sent packing. They had been advised contrary. Or they had been advised to vacate and leave Tunisia for the French. And therefore, as of compensation, okay, they had to be given media. Okay? And indeed, with the concerted effort of other European powers like Austria, Hungary, countries like Britain, countries like Russia, countries like Germany, they recognize the Italian occupation of Libya in 1911. Don't forget, the Italians had already been suffocated. They had already been humiliated. They had already been frustrated mm, in their quest for colonies. Remember, they had tried to take over Ethiopia. Okay? They had tried to take over Ethiopia eh, in 1896. But their attempts... Uh, seemed futile, okay? And the attempts ended in a fiasco when they tried to take on the Ethiopians who by then were under Menlik II. The Italians were taught a bitter lesson and the Italians were defeated at the Battle of Adoa, okay? At the Battle of Adoa in 1896. That was a humiliation on the side of the Italians. And therefore, occupation of Libya was part of, was part of uh, compensation, okay? And was part of revenge, okay? If you've been following, you can see how the whole of uh, Africa was being taken over, but the major problem originating from the British occupation of Egypt. Now, um, Probably to retake you through for those who have not been following, because of course I know uh, we've moved a supersonic speed. We said we started with 
the French being ousted as a result of their failure to participate in the suppression of the Rabi's revolt. And we say that ended the bilateral control of Egypt between Britain and France and marked the beginning of the unilateral control of Egypt by Britain. Okay? And how did the French react? We are looking at the reactions of other European powers, but basing on the British takeover of Egypt. And we say the first reaction for the French was to go into West Africa, and we earmarked the countries that the French took over. Then we said the British did not just sit back and watch. They followed the French up into West Africa, and between the two, there was a cutthroat competition for colonies in West Africa, and we tried to earmark some of the countries that were annexed by, by the British in West Africa. Then we talked about the assertion that was made by Professor Prompt mm, in 1883, okay, of changing or diverting the waters of the Nile to the interested parties. And indeed, we said that made the British to panic. And what did it result in too? Because the British were so much interested in the Nile, and that explains why they partly took over Egypt, because to them, Egypt was the Nile, and the Nile was Egypt. We said it would be useless for them to control the Nile right from Egypt without controlling it from its source, okay? So, Uganda was annexed because it had the source of the Nile, okay? Then we said Uganda was landlocked, and therefore what happened? Kenya was annexed, okay? Then in order to beef, beef, beef up and consolidate their claims over Egypt, okay, uh, Cecil Rhodes, okay, came up with the idea of painting Africa red, okay, and all the areas that we are annexed, and so on and so forth. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. And then you bring on other factors.